gonna Hello? Be better than that, right? I just, okay. Yeah. Let's giddy up. That's good. You deserve it. <laughs> well, I don't We're know, 20 seconds in tonight, and I think some of us would like to get home before the weather gets bad. Right. No, no, there's no money. It's snowing. It's, it's, it's sunny in Parker. I get it. I called to order the board of directors for Dr. Cog Wednesday, November 20th. And uh, would you all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, everybody. And now can we have a roll call? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And apologies in advance if I butcher your name. <clears throat> All right. Ava Henry. Eva, but it works. It works. It works. <laughs> it's starting already. <laughs> Are you there? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Jeff Baker. Hey, Bill Holland. Elise Jones. All right. Randy Wheelock. George Marlin. Nicholas Williams. Kevin Flynn. Here, but it's Keevan. <laughs> I guess that's what I get. Okay. Uh, Roger Partridge. Laura Thomas. Ron Angles. Libby Zabo. Perfect. Bob Pfeiffer. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Bob Roth. Allison Hilt, Larry Vidum, Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Sam Weaver, Margot Ramson, Lynn Baca, Matt Johnston, Roger Hudson, Ben Price, George Teal, Jason Gray, Tammy Maurer, Carrie Penaloza, Jeremy Fay, Randy Wheel, Here. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Benjamin Hussman, Jackie Thomas, Catherine Whitman, <clears throat> Steve Conklin, Here. Linda Olson, Here. Bill Here. Gipp, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Drew Peterson. Bobby Sindelar. Lisa Jones. <clears throat> Laura Brown. Lynette Kelsey. Here. Rachel Binkley. Present. Jim Dale. Here. George Lance. Here. Mike Hillman. Stephanie Walton. Alexandra Lynch. Dana Gutwine, Jacob Labeur, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Larry Strock, Jacob Lofgren, Wynn Shaw, Here. Joan Peck, Ashley Stolzman, Here. excuse me, Connie Sullivan, Joyce Palazuski. Paul Sutton, Sean Ferre, Chris Larson, Julie Duran Malika, Joyce Downing, John Dyack, <clears throat> Sally Daigle, Dave Black, Sandy Hammerly, Clint Folsom, Jessica Sandgren, Jack Phillips, Herb Atchison, Here. Bud Starker, Present. Adam Zarin, Rebecca White, Bill Van Meter. Here. We have
have a quorum. So thank you, everybody. I also want to welcome George Lance from Grun Village as a new member. Uh, and also uh, Debbie Fahey from Louisville as the alternate. Um, okay, yeah. So uh, let's move. I need to move for the approval of the agenda. I have a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? It passes. Moving right along to informational, we would like to introduce uh, Ms. Hood to come up and why don't you introduce the Kendrick Lake Elementary School on the first Lego League president. All right, hi everybody. Tonight we have a very special event for your first item. So I just wanna invite up the first Lego League from Kendrick Lakes and they are gonna give a presentation to you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson, and I'm a coach of uh, the Lego Robotics team for Kendrick Lakes Elementary. We're part of an organization called the First Lego League, or FLL. FLL challenges to engage children ages 9 to 16 in research problem solving, coding, and engineering while adhering to first core values focused on teamwork, discovery, and innovation. This year's theme is City Shaper. It's intended to give the kids an opportunity to explore ways they can help the communities they are part of reach new heights. Since the team came together in August, they have been looking at some of the challenges faced by modern cities and how technology could help solve one of those problems. After presentations from a few of the Dr. Cog members in the city of Sheridan, along with some online research, the, city, the team has decided to tackle the last mile problem. Following the presentation, the team will take questions or comments. Any feedback from you tonight will be used to improve their solution before getting in front of the judges on Saturday. That's their competition. Thank you very much for your time. And with that, I'd like to present to you the Kendrick Lakes Elementary School RoboPins. Come over here. Read your cards. I'll hold it. I'll hold it. Hello, we are the Robofins, team number 38554. I am Ellie. I'm Ashu. I'm Frankie. I'm Maddie. I'm Ashu. Okay. Our problem is the last mile problem. To come up with this problem, we talked to you guys, the Dr. Cog members, the city manager of Sheridan, and again, the Dr. Cog board. The last mile problem is getting to mass transit on your daily commute and just getting where you need to go when you don't have a convenient way to get there. The last mile problem is essentially the stretch of commute getting people from their houses to mass transit or from mass transit to their houses. The current solutions for the last mile problem are used by people every day to get where they need to go. Some of these solutions include ride sharing, biking, riding a scooter, hoverboards, or just flat out walking. Although it gets the job done, it isn't always convenient to do because of weather, distance, etc. We think mass transit is great because one, it's less traffic, two, it moves more people, three, it's less pollution, and four, it's cheaper. We think that drone cars are helpful because they make mass transit more convenient. The solution we decided on is drone cars. Our drone cars are self-driving and self-flying cars. If we don't like flying or there is bad weather outside, our drone cars will drive for you. If there is traffic or you want to fly, our drone cars will fly for you. After getting to the train, the drone car will go back to the tra station it came from. According to CNET.com, a flying taxi debuted at the 2018 Geneva Motor Show. A, a year ago, a scale model of the concept made its first successful flight. The drone car popularity will pick up in 2025, according to Porsche. We think that these will be usable in the next five to ten years, according to research. 
We built drone cars to let our drone cars charge on their charging pads. We placed them at specific light rail stations because we think trains are the most efficient way of mass transit. We also put a three mile radius limit on how far our drone cars can go so they don't go too far when they don't have to. Also to cover most of the urban areas without going where we aren't needed. After setting all of our stations at light rail locations, we noticed that there were still some big plots of urban areas that were not covered by our three mile radius. To solve this, we set, added some extra stations that were not on light rail lines so that our drone cars can get to those people. Our app is on a device like a phone, tablet, or computer. You will hit a button that will send a signal to a drone car that will come and pick you up. It could order you a train ticket and drop you off at a train station. Based on weather, your opinion, and, our, and your location, our app will let you choose whether you want to fly or drive. We shared our first LEGO League experience with Dr. Cog members and the Dr. Cog board. The Sheridan City Manager, the Westwood Wolves, another um, FLL team, the Kendrick Lakes Junior LEGO League. First LEGO League Junior Expo and Friends and Family. Thank you for your time. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Are the driving, the drones, the same cost, whether you drive or fly? Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We can hear you up here. I don't know about All right. Well, oh, there we go. A comment first. I work for RTD, and we just spent a lot of money doing a study, studying the very same thing you guys are recommending. <laughs> and I wish my team who worked on that study had heard some of your ideas. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so that was my comment. And then my question. So do you think that people could share your drones so like if I wanted to go to the station at the same time as my neighbor, I could carpool in a flying drone or a driving drone? Um, so yes, it's kind of like a taxi, I guess. Um, yeah, multiple people can get on. Anybody else? Cool. Thank you. brother. I think the question is how much would it cost to get a drone car? Additional research is needed. <laughs> <coughs> yes, please. How fast will they fly? The question is how fast will they fly? Well, like the same additional research needed. Uh, so we set a three mile radius onto it so it won't go too far, so it'll take like, well, it won't take very long. What we, need, we need to let them get back. Oh, uh, one last question. About how long does it take um, once you plug, uh, you, you make the request in your cell phone? Um, for the car or your drone to get Well, it depends on how far the charging station is from your house and how far the light rail is. Real quick, how far away are our stations? Also, um, wait, what was the question? Real quick. Three mile radius. How far are our drones? Oh, yeah, three miles. So, and also, like, where you live and the distance between the charging thing in your house. Thank you. Thank you. I think Doug was looking for resumes out of that.
I think CDOT could have also used some of that advice, like RTD. Uh, moving right along, we have a community spotlight this evening with Boulder County. Uh, Lise Jones, Director Jones. And do I just... Well, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> just three miles. More research is needed. Um, so good evening, Dr. Coggers. Thanks for letting me talk a little bit about my jurisdiction. I thought I'd give you a quick overview in case it's been a while since you've been up my way. Um, and then I thought it's Dr. Cog. I'll tell you what we're doing to help implement Metro Vision, which we unanimously adopted back in 2017. So here goes. At a glance, uh, our 325,000 people population puts us as the eighth largest county. We have 10 municipalities that range in size from Ward at 155 people, rusted cars sort of outnumber the people, to our county seat in Boulder of 110,000. We're really defined by our topography. We're bounded on the, our western border by the Continental Divide, including the iconic Long's Peak in Rocky Mountain National Park and then by planes on our eastern side. For equity's sake, I must point out that we used to be the land of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute, who were forcibly displaced when coal and gold were discovered in the late 1850s. And we are proud to be one of the original 17 counties in the territory of Colorado when it was established in 1861. But today we are still shaped by our outstanding natural setting, and our brand and economy is really based on our high quality of life, which attracts residents, visitors, students, entrepreneurs who are drawn to our scenery and, of course, our outdoor recreation opportunities, be it hiking or mountain biking on some of the 110 miles of public land trails that the county manages, or skiing at Eldora, or beer drinking, which is indeed a recreational sport where I come from. <laughs> Nearly 40,000 students um, attend CU Boulder, Naropa University, and Front Range Community College in Longmont. And our communities draw millions of visitors each year to places like Boulder's Pearl Street Mall and, of course, the ever-popular Frozen Dead Guys Day Festival in Netherland, proof that we also don't take ourselves too seriously. So how are we doing with Metro Vision? Um, so I went through and just took the five themes, the first one being place. And to better protect our environment and quality of life, which are really the economic bread and butter in Boulder County, Boulder County's overall land use philosophy is really focused on compact growth and open space preservation. We adopted our first comprehensive plan in 1978, and through it, we keep rural lands rural. We send intensive uses in urban development to our towns and cities where there are services and infrastructure. And we cooperate with our municipalities by signing IGAs that identify where development and an annexation will occur and where it won't, which are lands identified for, pre for preservation. And this map, although hard to see, the uh, towns are gray and they're surrounded by green, either city or county open space. Because that, oops, um, that's a key piece of this. We um, have used voter approved sales taxes since 1993 to permanently protect 105,000 of acres of open space through conservation easement and fee title acquisition. And those provide the buffers between communities that you just saw, prevent sprawl, provide wildlife habitat, and those trails for recreation that you saw people on earlier. 25,000 acres of this is agricultural land, which we then lease back to 65 farmers and ranchers. And Farming is a tough business, and so we recently updated our land use regulations to make it easier for farmers to get land use approval for uh, farm events like farm to table dinners, to, to put hoop houses up and the like, um, it, to really protect our agricultural economy. Metro Vision theme two, and I'm sorry those are blurry, that's taken right off of the Dr. Cobb, webs Dr. Cobb website. <laughs> Dr. Cog website. Anyway, uh, Metro Vision theme two is mobility. And uh, Boulder County really has a multimodal transportation vision. That shouldn't be news to you. We focus on connecting and moving people affordably, sustainably, and safely. And we also fo focus now on drone cars. <laughs> Some of our recent highlights are the US 36 Express Lanes project, which was completed in 2016. This 18-mile project 
added a new managed lane each way um, between Denver and Boulder, carries the Flatiron Flyer Bus Rapid Transit and HOV3 carpoolers, as well as toll paying single occupancy vehicles. And it has a bikeway that goes the whole length used by commuters. The whole project has been wildly successful with a 9% increase in bus ridership, a 29% increase in travel speeds across all lanes, including the general purpose ones, and over 80,000 bike trips per year. So to address growing travel demand and improve mobility throughout the Northwest region, particularly because we don't have our rail, um, RTD teamed up with the local communities in Boulder, Boulder County area and completed the Northwest Area Mobility Study, or NAMS, back in 2014. And it prioritized a list of mobility improvements for the region that included adding BRT along the region's arterials, including State Highway 119, which is pictured here between Boulder and Longmont, which is our top priority, followed by State Highway 7 and 287. These should ring dim bells with you at least because you approved money for them in the tip. Thank you very much. And this is what um, 119 would look like with a, a bikeway and a managed lane similar to US 36. The MetroVision theme three is about the environment. Boulder County has already experienced firsthand the impacts of a warming climate. We were home to what was at the time the most destructive wildfire in our state's history, the Four Mile Canyon fire in 2010. And then three years later, we were hit with one of the worst flood disasters Colorado has ever seen, which we're still rebuilding from six years later. So we're really aware of the cost of extreme weather events and are very committed to climate mitigation and resiliency efforts. Here's a few examples of what we're doing. Since homes consume nearly one third of the energy used in Boulder County, our res uh, residential green building code is build smart. It sets strong requirements for energy efficiency as well as uh, water conservation with the goal of requiring all new homes to be zero net energy by 2022, which means that they produce as much energy as they consume. Our Energy Smart and PACE programs have helped over 18,000 homeowners and 3,200 businesses, which are 60% of the businesses in our county, to install energy efficiency, renewable energy, water conservation, and zero waste improvements using expert advisors, rebates, and low cost financing. And we are electrifying our county fleet, helping our residents buy EVs through bulk purchase discount programs that help lower the, the price. And then working through the state's Charge Ahead Colorado grant program uh, to install charging stations both at county sites and to help local businesses uh, install their own charging stations as well. All told, over 70 EV charging stations have been put in place in Boulder County and more on the way. And then, Lastly, we know that taking action on our own isn't enough. So Boulder County worked with partners to help create Colorado Communities for Climate Action, or CC4CA. I think Anita Seitz is in the house. She was the, the past president. And it's a coalition of nearly 30 cities and counties advocating for state and federal policy change, including many of you in the room. Theme number four is about healthy and inclusive communities. Like many places in the metro area, Boulder County is suffering from an affordable housing crisis. More than 50,000 people in our county live in severely cost burdened households, meaning they spend more than half of their income on housing. So Boulder County teamed up with the cities and towns in our county to craft a regional, regional affordable housing plan, which set a regional goal of having 12% of our housing inventory be permanently affordable to low and middle income households by 2035. That's a total of 18,000 units and we're a third of the way there. It was adopted by nine of our 10 municipalities. We're still working on Erie, Bill. That was loving, loving. <laughs> and, and the plan sets a menu of strategies that, that communities can voluntary, voluntarily use to help meet that regional goal. Land banking, raising additional funding, uh, preserving existing uh, affordable units, streamlining regulations and the like. And we are embarking on a public awareness campaign now called Home Wanted to really put a face on the problem. Who are the, you know, the teachers, the firefighters that are really having a hard time living in our communities to help build support for the solutions. Last but not least, MetroVision theme five is about vitality. And our regional economy prospers when all residents have access to transportation options for their basic needs and quality of life. So
So our housing authority in Boulder County has built 425 permanently affordable housing units in the last seven years with another 499 units in the pipeline. And we've done this across the county. Um, this is an example of Tungsten Village in Netherland. We try to put these uh, close to transit. This one is across the street from the RTD Park and Ride and should be open next summer. And then last but not least, we have a mobility for all program that works to provide accessible and affordable mobility for people with uh, mobility challenges like seniors, people with disabilities, low income populations, and so we do things like provide transit passes to people who live in our low-income housing, um, do uh, help earn a bike program, uh, doing bike clinics, and um, we've launched a pilot program with Lyft. So we're trying all sorts of things to, again, help people meet their mobility needs. So that is just a, those are just a few of the things that we're doing to meet Metro Vision goals. Happy to answer any questions or talk to anyone afterwards about any of these programs. Thank you very much, Director Jones. Any questions for Boulder County? Any comments? A great job, Director Jones, on your presentation. It's good to see that you're hitting on all cylinders on all of our five chapters of our Metro Vision. Um, next up, we have the report of the chair. A um, few things. One, uh, we did lose some members during the election. Uh, Director Roth and Director Beacom uh, did not get reelected, and uh, you know that was uh, unfortunate. They've big contributors to Dr. Cog, and I uh, uh, wish them well. I also, on a lighter note, I'd like to congratulate all those that did get reelected uh, this last uh, November and uh, congratulate you all in a successful election. Um, I think that's all I have, so I'll move it right over to the report on performance and engagement committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Port Performance and Engagement Committee met. Uh, we selected Director Teal to serve on the nominating committee as our member from the nominate, for the nominating committee from Performance and Engagement, and we discussed uh, Director Rex's salary adjustment to reflect his excellent performance the previous year. Okay, and then a report from the Finance and Budget Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We, uh, uh, we selected uh, Director Elise Jones for the uh, F&B um, member on the nominating committee, and we uh, passed four resolutions authorizing Doug, the executive director, to move forward with various uh, uh, nutrition, transportation, and other uh, and senior services contracts with our providers. Thank you very much. Moving right along, report from the executive director, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Want to see that up? Thank you. Um, just, a f just a couple things for me this evening. First of all, there will not be a December board work session. Yay. So you're welcome. <laughs> Moving through the time. Inside voice, inside voice. <laughs> uh, you have a couple flyers at your, at your places today uh, talking about the Dr. Cog Award celebration. I mentioned last month that we that that meeting, uh, so please mark your calendars for April 22nd. Um, we're excited to be, had, be uh, hosting it this year at uh, Empower Field at Mile High, uh, which is a definitely a non-traditional venue for us. So we're we're, uh, we're we're excited about that opportunity. We are opening up the nominations for our three major award categories. So and you'll be able to f uh, you know fill out online and all that kind of good stuff. So the Metro Vision Awards is the first one, which honors the projects, plans, and programs that advance the region's aspirations, as outlined in Metro Vision Plan. The John V. Christensen Award, which is our highest personal honor and recognizes someone who contributed significantly to the region over many years. Last year's honoree was former Centennial Mayor and Dr. Cog Board Director Kathy Noon. So those who were in attendance, I think we're, we're certainly delighted that, uh, that Kathy was, uh, was uh, the uh, selected winner for the John V. Christensen. Um, the Way to Go Awards honor employers and, em and individuals who are making significant contributions to reducing traffic and improving air quality within the region. That's an also, also, so those are three major categories. Um, so please, I mean, if you have, have projects, P 
people, whatever it is that you think might be a good fit for one of these awards, please uh, s shoot in your nominations. Again, you can do those online, and the deadline is January 17th. If you have questions, please reach out to me or Steve Erickson, our Communications and Marketing Director. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions for Mr. X? Seeing all right. Um, got a couple. Uh, so Medicare open enrollment, I mentioned this last month that we're currently in Medicare enrollment. Um, Dr. Ha Cog, we house the State Health Insurance Assistance Program, or SHIP, offering free objective counseling to individuals uh, wandering through the Medicare jungle out there. There are 52 plans that are available um, throughout the state, so it can be a little bit overwhelming. And to date, Dr. Cox's staff has counseled just under 500 uh, individuals related to this. So it's uh, we're working overtime back there in the SHIFT program, and we're, we're real proud of the work that they're doing associated with that. Um, I asked uh, Chuck if he would tee up a video. A couple months ago, we shared with you a video related to our Vision Zero, Regional Vision Zero initiative um, that was created and produced in-house. Um, I wanted to show you guys tonight another video that staff's been working on. It's related to our, re our Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan for the year 2050. We just, and we're initiating that tonight, and we actually have a, a presentation for you a little later on talking about some scenario planning that we want to do. So I wanted to share this video with you in hopes that you might share this um, with your networks, whether that be social media related or through your, your community access channels or what, but uh, just let the video play. We're always on the go, walking, driving, biking. We all have places to be, but how often do we stop to think about everything that makes it possible to get where we need to go? Adding transit lines, constructing and fixing roads, creating bike paths, all these things make it possible for us to move around the region. They help us connect to the world around us, whether we're going to the grocery store, our jobs or school, to visit with family and friends, or to explore nature. As our region continues growing, we simply can't take for granted that our current infrastructure and systems will always be able to support our population. The Denver Regional Council of Governments brings community leaders together from across 10 counties to decide how our region funds and prioritizes transportation investments. The Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan looks ahead to 2050 so we can prepare for our population's continued growth over the next 30 years. The plan anticipates the region's needs and we're involving residents to learn how we can meet those needs from expanding our public transportation network to improving our roadways to making biking and walking safer and more accessible. Learn more about the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and how you can shape the future of transportation. Right, thank you very much. No, we're we're pretty proud of the talented staff. Of course, we have at Dr. Cog. I mean, it's and that was a that was an agency-wide effort too because I know the script was written by folks in communication and marketing in conjunction with transportation planning operations folks. The voice you heard on that was an ombudsman in our AAA program, and the actual um, you know video itself was done by um, by uh, Sarah in um, uh, in communication and marketing too. So we're very proud of it. And if you would like a copy of that to share on your public access television, or in, um, but we will be of course getting it out on social media, and you can pick it up there as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Rex? All right, moving right along to item number nine, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues with, for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will be begin immediately after the last speaker. Do I have anyone requesting to speak? Seeing none, we're moving right along to number 10 on our item, uh, on our list, consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda, which is the minutes of the October 16th. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
That carries. Moving into action items number 11, discussion of the 2020 budget, attachment B in your packet, uh, Jenny Dock, Director of Accounting and Finance. Should have like, you know, music that goes with it. The play, jazz hands is fine. Jazz hands is fine. But it's like you're going up to bat, you should have, you know, music going along with it. Now, thank you, Board of Directors, for letting me come and speak with you this evening. My name is Jenny Dock. I am the Director of Administration and Finance, and Director Jones, I am a proud mother of a CU grad. So thank you for your presentation on Boulder County. <laughs> I don't think she's listening, but <laughs> either way, thank you. <laughs> Definitely caught her. Say, say, <laughs> trying to convince Erie to join the forces. Just say you're welcome, Perfect. Elise. Yep. <laughs> so be it. <laughs> no, I wanted to come and talk to you this evening about the 2020 budget. Um, again, thanks for allowing me some time. I thought I would start off just by explaining our budget process. So we do not take our budget lightly here at Dr. Cog. It is actually a very thorough and thoughtful process that we enter into. Uh, the process actually starts in July, and that is when the different divisions and staff all come together and begin to talk about what programs and projects that they foresee in the coming year. We also work with our brokers, such as our health insurance broker and um, employers council to also get economic data that will help inform what we feel like the um, what our health insurance rates will be and that sort of thing in the coming year. So that all starts in July and August. The draft budgets come to myself and Doug for review. In August, we actually go to the board workshop and present our work plan to the board of directors. And that is their opportunity or your opportunity to give input into the projects that we plan on pursuing in the coming year, which really does inform the budget process. In September, we take a draft budget to the Finance and Budget Committee for their review, and that is their opportunity to ask questions, do a deep dive, and, and if there's any further research they want us to do or anything of that nature, we go ahead and do that. In October, we take the final draft budget for their review, and then they vote if they will recommend it for approval for you all, and that brings us today to November where we ask for you to approve it. So this is the big picture. Um, overall, our beginning general fund balance is just a little over $8 million. Our revenues, we expect to be a little over $27 million. Our expenses, about the same. Our pass-through funds, which are dollars that we directly pass on to different contractors, such as, in this case, it's mostly with the Area Agency on Aging. So that's money we pass on to Meals on Wheels, Visiting Nurses Association, Seniors Resource Center, and vendors such as that. Our ending general fund balance, we project to be just about the same. And the little bit of increase there from the beginning balance is what we think will be our revenue from investments. So our total operating budget is projected to be about 43 million. So I have been at Dr. Cog for five years, and this is the fifth budget I've done. And I thought it'd be interesting to look back at how much we've grown since 2016. And as you can see, it's actually quite a bit. So a few fun facts here. Um, just since last year, our budget is growing by 10%. From 2016, our budget is growing by 45%. So in five years, our total operating budget is 45% greater than what our actuals were in 2016. So that's just really, really, really impressive. We've also grown by personnel by 30%. Um, the average employee base five years ago was about 95 employees. Today, we're averaging around 120. Roberta would correct me and say it's 118, but it's 120, it's around there. <laughs> We've also grown by one division, which is our human resources division, which has been exciting as well. 
So also back in 2015, 16 timeframe, one of the things we really started talking about was diversifying our revenue. And back in the day, our mainstream of revenue was, well, Older Americans Act money, and then UPWP funding, which is the CPG grant, also CMAC funding. So those were kind of our three big heavy hitters. And we all decided that, hey, it's time to diversify our revenue, that only having three major streams of revenue isn't a good idea for any organization. So we began reaching out and considering new programs. And today, these are programs that you will see in today's budget that were not in our budget back in 2015 or 2016. So the first one there we have is Veterans Directed Care. This year, that'll be about $3.4 million. And that is funded by the VA. Then we have the Accountable Health Communities. Some of you may know it as the AHC grant. And that comes from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, and that's at 1.3 million. We also have the program that Doug just referenced, the State Health Insurance Assistance Program, or what we call SHIP. That is funded by the Administration for Community Living and also state homestead funds, and that's reaching almost a half a million dollars. We have the Human Service Transportation Set Aside, funded by FASTER funds at a million dollars. Ride Alliance from the FTA at about 350,000, the I-25 GAP project at about 250,000, and then the different data acquisition projects that are reaching about $1.5 million. And those are funded by various partners, some jurisdictions sitting here today, and also USGS. So when you look at that, that comes to $8.25 million out of a $43 million operating budget. So today, our revenue diversification is equaling about 19% of our overall budget, where five years ago, it was about 5%. So we really have reached that goal of diversifying our revenue and bringing in different forms of funding. So I asked the question, what does it all mean, right? We have a lot of different money coming in. <laughs> well, it's actually very good for our community because it means that we can serve more people. We can also have more demographics of people served. One of those demographics, particularly the veterans community, we have different programs now that are serving, serving that community that we weren't serving five years ago. It's allowing us to make data, data analysis, make technological improvements, healthier communities, cleaner air, better quality of life, we're reducing healthcare costs, and we are contributing to taxpayer savings, and I'm sure a lot more. So at the end of the day, some of you may say, well, wow, we're growing a lot. That's a little scary. Are we able to do this? And the good news is, is that even with all of our growth, if you look at our general fund balance, it's pretty much stayed the same. So what that says is throughout all of the growth that we're experiencing, we're still able to maintain our financial stability. So that's all very good news. So with that being said, I'm happy to take any questions you have about the budget. Director Atchison. Jenny, between you and uh, Jayla, because we're already starting to see continuing resolution on the budget from the feds, are we back to the same situation we were last time of starting to notify potential our support contractors? Are we doing anything there? Mm -hmm. Okay, grab another mic. So Mickey is our federal lobbyist. Mickey uh, Farrell is is working very closely with the help committee with um, staying on top of the Older Americans Act reauthorization. But it is going to be a challenge this year. The thing that's different this year um, compared to two years ago was that we didn't have the homestead fundings uh, or funds. And this year we have homestead funds, so we're doing pretty good. Um, we had three million extra dollars. We've held back some money in anticipation that we would have trouble getting our federal dollars. So we might have a scenario, I hope we don't have a scenario where we're cutting services. We might have a scenario where we say to our providers, oh, we got our federal funding now, and now you have three months to spend a chunk of money, right? So we don't have to give it back. But I think that's a better problem than cutting services. In light of that, Jenny, if we have that money that's held up by continuing resolution, do we have anything in the general fund that would allow us to keep that 
funding whole until we get the release of the federal dollars, is that even allowable under our scenario? And then pull that money instead of spending it, we pull it back and replenish the general fund. You know, and that's why member dues are so important, if I can give that plug, because honestly, that's why, um, you know, member dues serve a number of purposes, and one of them is to help us maintain our general fund balance, so that if there is a situation where funding is withheld, we do have en enough resources to sustain these programs for a certain amount of time. So, yes, our general fund allows us to be able to pay all expenses for the whole organization for a minimum of three months. And so if we're looking at one particular division or, or a couple of different programs, then certainly we do have funding that would help sustain us through times like that. Any other questions or comments? Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, I, I just wanted to point out one thing with regards to the funding diversification and those additional grants and that, that, we, that we were lucky enough to, um, to be this, the uh, recipient of. I, I just want to make it make it clear with you all that you understand that we don't chase money just for the sake of chasing money. We, we make sure that those, the grants that we do go after, and Lord knows, Jenny knows this better than most, are, 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 um, are consistent with our core missions, right? So ones that fit well within what we are as Dr. Cog. And we're very, very uh, conscious about that. We actually just got another Adola grant here in the last couple of weeks associated with um, uh, the uh, 2020 census and making sure we get an accurate count of our seniors because um, the funding that we get at the federal level mm -hmm. is associated That's state, and, yeah. and state, mm -hmm. federal and state is associated with an accurate count, right? The number of seniors within our region. So um, it's, uh, so for example, that obviously makes sense. So I just wanted to make that clear. And the last thing I wanted to point out is that um, I want to thank our, uh, um, our um, finance and, and, uh, and accounting staffs and the tremendous work they do, Jenny and her team, it's amazing. You know, as you increase the complexity of the number of grants, they're all, none of them are alike, right? Um, there's an education that's required to make sure that we're on top of exactly what is required with those grants, and Jenny and her folks do an unbelievable job. I think Roberta is also here, is she? Yes, Roberta? Yeah. Raise your hand right there. Re Roberta and Jenny, they do mm -hmm. unbelievable work, and we're so, so fortunate to have them. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you very much, Jenny. Oh, I need a motion. Sorry, it's an action item. So I have a motion from the floor. Second. I have a first and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Carries. Moving now along to number 12, uh, selection of a member of the nominating committee, attachment <coughs> senior packet, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, each year, the, the, the nominating committee uh, convenes to, uh, to select it at the January meeting um, the uh, uh, board nominations for the executive committee members. Specifically, it is the vice chair, secretary, and treasurer are the ones that they they, the slate that they uh, provide to you for, for nominations. Our articles are such that the, the, um, the board chair uh, just advances automatically from vice chair to, to chair, and of course you have the, the past chair as well. So um, the nomination committee is made up of six members, the, uh, the immediate past chair of the board, which is uh, Director Atchison, uh, one member from the, uh, representing the city county of Denver, which I believe is gonna be Nicholas, right? Um, one member from the Performance and Engagement Committee, as um, direct, Director Stolzman had indicated, is George Teal. And tonight at the Finance and Budget Committee, uh, Director Elise Jones was selected f for, for their representative. And one member selected from the board and another member um, selected by the, the chair. So this evening, um, we are going to, I guess I can turn it to you to, to, to do this vote, but we need to appoint someone from the, from the board. Yes, Director Jones. I'd like to nominate Director Dale from Golden. You accept the nomination, Director Dale? Any other nominations from the floor? Yes, uh, Director Salzman. I'd like to yeah. nominate Director Mullica. Director Mullica, do you accept the nomination? I do, thanks. Any other nominations from the floor? Okay, I guess all nominations, I guess I'll close that. 
And uh, then I guess I would need to do a, an appointment from the board for Director Dale. And then I will put Director Mollica as my point. Can I do that at one? I think so. Yeah. And that's all taken care of. So I need a motion to accept those. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Carries. Thank you for your service. This is very important for the direction of the organization. Next up, informational briefings, item number 13, presentation on the I-70 coalition, attachment D in your packet. Uh, Mr. Papsdorf. Needs jazz hands, I guess, too. Any? Jazz hands. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Okay, I guess it's Margaret Bowles coming up to yes. do this. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. Ah, thank you. So again, Margaret Bowes, I'm the director of the I-70 Coalition, and I'll start with just a really quick overview of the organization. We're a nonprofit TMO. We are supported by membership dues, and our mission is to enhance mobility and accessibility throughout the Mountain Corridor. Uh, we do this through joint public and private partnerships, and ultimately we advocate for improvements. And um, we do this through very direct involvement, being an active stakeholder in absolutely every study, process, plan, project that has anything to do with the I-70 corridor. And then we also work to maintain attention with our state legislature, our transportation commissioners, and our congressional delegation. So we are 27 uh, counties, towns, and businesses. They're listed here. And most of our private sector members are, or all of our private sector members are large employers, so primarily the resorts. So I don't think I need to spend too much time on the problem. I think we're all very aware. Um, <laughs> it's severe congestion. How many people in this room have not had a frustrating experience on I-70? No hands. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, we're talking about a highway where the capacity remains largely unchanged since 79, yet since that point in time, the population in Colorado has more than doubled. Um, we um, have the hourly and daily, most of the, or the top 10 daily hourly counts at the Eisenhower Tunnel have uh, been broken just since 2016 and continue to fall winter and summer. And CDOT does pre predict these volumes to continue to grow. Why? Because we know a lot of people want to move to Colorado. Um, grow by three million people with most of those folks landing on the front range. So back in 2007, the Denver Metro Chamber wanted to put um, a price tag on this congestion. So they did a study and that study says that I-70 congestion costs the state of Colorado $839 million per year. So um, impacts, I think it's real easy for people to think I-70 congestion is just an inconvenience for skiers, but of course it's much more than that. The impacts are broad. Um, the mountain resort destinations are very significant economic drivers. Most of those are accessed via I-70. They contribute upwards of 20% of the state's tourism revenue and contribute $88 million to the uh, annual tax receipts. And then, of course, there's tourism impacts. We have uh, done, over the last eight years, some research with frequent, I, um, frequent skiers and snowboarders that live on the Front Range. And last time we surveyed them, 69% said that their trips to ski and snowboard have decreased simply because of the I-70 congestion. So there's also a concern that as Colorado skiing becomes synonymous with traffic, that we are going to lose some of that market share of our destination visitors to other states such as Utah. And then, of course, quality of life. Many of your constituents live here, moved here, took jobs here because they love the mountains. And without a doubt, uh, the, the quality of life or I-70 congestion is becoming a very significant barrier to accessing the mountains and uh, outdoor recreation opportunities. So there is a plan in place. It is the I-70 record of decision. That's the result of a very lengthy PEIS process. 
and uh, that is our guiding documents for all types of improvements that will happen on the corridor. That document in a nutshell says that to meet the capacity needs through the year 2050, the solution has to be multimodal. Just six lane in the corridor will not get us where we need to be those lanes will fill up in a matter of years. So we do need to look for multimodal s solutions. So this document uh, breaks out uh, improvements into three categories, highway improvements, high-speed transit, determining that fe feasibility, and then looking at non-infrastructure improvements. Those are things like maintenance, enforcement, transit and carpool use, uh, providing good real-time information to travelers, those sorts of things. And I'll take these one at a time. First of all, the uh, I-70 rod does have a long list of very specific highway improvements that are needed, a lot of interchange work, some auxiliary lanes, but it does direct us to look to the worst of the congestion, the pinch points, and those are around Floyd Hill and Idaho Springs. So that's why we've seen most of the improvements in those areas. The twin tunnels, now called the Veterans Memorial Tunnels, were widened and we have now, three years now, the eastbound Mountain Express Lane. I think you're probably mostly familiar, that is an improved shoulder for a 13-mile stretch that is open only during peak travel times. And that has really exceeded expectations um, as far as the benefits it's brought the corridor. It's increased throughput, it's decreased travel times um, for all lanes, not just the tolled lane, and, and has accomplished its goal, which is to provide a reliable travel time. We have its sister project, um, essentially the same footprint, same type project under construction now. That's the westbound Mountain Express Lane. And then the I-70 Coalition has listed or determined a couple priorities. And we um, recognize Floyd Hill as the number one priority that we think needs to be tackled next. That would be a, a third lane on the west side of Floyd Hill in the westbound direction. And that would uh, reduce congestion. It would replace that project a structurally deficient bridge. It would do some curve straightening and interchange work, which would increase safety. And um, another, another argument for pri prioritizing that proje project is that it would capitalize on many of the investments that we've already made, such as the veterans tunnels and the uh, soon to be westbound Mountain Express Lane. That is a pretty, pretty big price tag for that project, $600 million is the estimate. CDOT uh, has identified some bridge enterprise funds. It is hopefully going to get some money from uh, the Senate Bill 267, but we still have a pretty, pretty significant gap to fund that project. So there's stakeholders along the corridor that are um, starting to brainstorm potential funding streams and working with HPTE to uh, help us look at some, some traffic and revenue um, uh, studies. So West Vale Pass, uh, the west side of Vale Pass is another priority project. Vail Pass closed 61 times just last winter. So we know that adding a third travel lane, it would be a third travel lane in both the eastbound and westbound direction on the west side of Vail Pass. And that would um, result in some pretty significant mobility and safety improvements. Again, price tag pretty high. It's estimated maybe around 500 million. And that is under going through its environmental assessment process right now. No funding has been identified for that project. So high-speed transit. The I-70 record decision did direct CDOT as a pretty early action item to look at the feasibility of an advanced guideway system. And that study was complete in 2014. It states that a high-speed transit system is technologically feasible. There are multiple technologies that would work for this corridor. It also stated that it is not fi financially feasible at this time. So um, some other studies have been done since then to continue the conversation and continue to answer some questions about a high-speed system. Uh, currently underway is the Front Range Passenger Rail Feasibility Study. And we're watching that with great interest because we know that for a mountain corridor transit system to be viable, it has to, of course, connect with a front range system, but it has to be interoperable. So we're keeping a close eye on discussions because, for example, if the front range rail goes heavy freight, that technology will not work on the I-70 mountain corridor. So that's, that's a conversation we're watching and hoping to be able to engage in those discussions.
So the third component is those infrastructure improvements I mentioned, essentially transportation demand management. That is a huge focus for the I-70 coalition. We are working ultimately to reduce congestion and we're doing this by trying to shift that travel demand. There's plenty of capacity on I-70 when it's not a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. So if we can get some folks to travel at off-peak times, we know that can yield some good results. We're also working to decrease the number of vehicles through carpooling and transit use. Um, so lots of it, public education and outreach. And we are a staff of 1.5 people and a very limited marketing budget. So I can't emphasize enough how much we uh, depend on partnerships to get our work done. CDOT is a great TDM partner for us. Uh, we do a lot of direct outreach with the public, paid advertising, other partnerships, the lodging sector, the resorts. We are increasingly reaching out or wanting to reach out to front range TMOs because we know they have um, a huge database at their fingertips of folks that have already expressed a willingness to carpool and use transit. So we hope to do more coordinating with front range TMOs in the future. And I would like to uh, give a shout out to the Dr. Cog TDM folks because over the last decade, they've been huge partners for us. I really can't emphasize that enough. Um, they've worked with us to see if we can adapt ride arrangers and iCarpool and van pools to see if any of those programs could um, be adapted to the Front Range Corridor. So really appreci appreciate Dr. Cog's support. We deliver all of our TDM information through our website, goi70.com. That is our platform for de delivering all of this. Uh, without a doubt, the, the feature that the public loves the most is our weekend travel forecast. It's posted every Thursday and lets people know what events, weather, construction might uh, be coming up and the typical traffic patterns so folks can travel, uh, plan around that congestion. We have all things rideshare, carpool, and carpool parking. A lot of the mountain towns and resorts have carpool parking incentive programs. We know a lot of folks use the dinosaur lots for meetup spots, so we have all of this information compiled here. And then mountain transit options. Um, Bustang has been uh, very well received, very well used on the I-70 mountain corridor. So this page lists all the opportunities folks have to get to and around the mountains without a personal vehicle. That is a, a real big push for us, especially this winter. So that's a good segue um, on the bus service. Snowstang is a direct Denver to resort bus system that will launch here uh, in just a few weeks. And the I-70 Coalition was very involved in having initial discussions with the resorts to try to get buy-in um, in that partnership. So I am thrilled that we have three ski areas that will participate, Arapaho Basin, Loveland Ski Area, and Steamboat Springs will all sign on to, to uh, serve their communities with snow staying. And then I mentioned we tried to uh, adopt or adapt uh, ride arrangers and I carpool to the mountain corridor. And we really did learn that a system that's designed for the weekday commute, Monday through Friday commute, really doesn't translate to the weekend discretionary travel. So we are, have been working with a new app. It's, it's going to be launching this winter. It's called Gondola. And it is 100% targeted towards the front range resident that wants to get up to the mountains and trying to connect people that are willing to offer a ride with those looking for a ride. And we have uh, spent a lot of time uh, making introductions between Gondola and many partners like resorts, local governments, CDOT. And we found that the some of the new climate action plan groups, especially in the mountain corridor, are ending up being really strong partners for us because their goals are similar to ours, trying to reduce the number of cars, and reduce carbon emissions. So transportation funding, I have this listed here as a focus for winter 2019-2020. It is always a focus, as it is for, I think, everyone in the state. Uh, without a doubt, the biggest roadblock to I-70 improvements is funding. We have multiple projects that are designed, they've been through their environmental review, and they're just sitting there awaiting funding. We've always been very supportive of a, finding a statewide funding solution. We were very engaged in Proposition 110. We supported Proposition CC. And I know there's lots more conversation bubbling up about um, regional solutions and some of the metro area jurisdictions 
kind of going it on their own. I certainly understand that motivation since the voters are, are not um, showing any willingness to create a sustainable funding stream. But um, I just, I, I'm so concerned what that might mean to our, our state infrastructure if we start kind of uh, peeling off and, and, and having just regionalized solutions could really leave the Eastern Plains and the Western Slope kind of hanging out there with, with no way to fund their transportation needs. So I don't, we certainly don't know what the answers are, but we really do hope that we can continue to have a conversation and work towards that statewide solution. So I will end there and time for Q&A. Is there time? Okay. Director Atchison. Well, there's a couple of things. One is uh, your traffic congestion goes on today because I-70 has been closed both directions off and on most of the afternoon but not because of congestion, but the weather. Mm -hmm. The one I want you to go back to is uh, Front Range Rail. Mm -hmm. We met with the governor's group this about a week ago, and the Front Range Rail is indicating that they will not talk to the I-70 coalition <coughs> on the connectability of rail between the two groups because they are statutorily restricted from doing that. What I will tell you in the group that's here we were very emphatic and we have support now of both the chair of the Senate and the House Transportation. They are gonna introduce legislation in this coming session to fix that communication problem. In fact, to require them to go talk to you. Fantastic. So I'm we hope that will because the technology you're, you're talking about is extremely different. Mm -hmm. uh, front range rail and what the mountain quarters may see would not be compatibility at all, but in, Let's just say that the group was not very receptive to some of the comments we heard from Front Range Rail of what they were proposing. I would say very calmly to the Speaker of the House, blew her top. I was there. I heard it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciated it. <laughs> yeah. So I think the other thing, too, is we have not, uh, I also sit with the Metro Mayor's group, we have not given up on a statewide solution. But we've got to find something, and we can't keep doing nothing. Agreed. You're absolutely correct. If we can't do it statewide, it's going to fall back to the regions are going to have to start doing something to fix their roads. But that's that's a conversation that has not stopped. Uh, it was discussed with the governor's task force just, well, when you were there a week and a half ago. We're not ready to quit on that, but we've got to find something that the voters will support, and that's the problem. Absolutely. Agreed. Thank you. Yes, Director Pinkley. I have family on the Western Slope, and I would love to utilize some of these things. However, I also have a dog, which needs to go with me. And I feel like a lot of people in Colorado have dogs that they take with them to the mountains. Have Has there been any thought around that? I mean, like, I feel like a lot of people. You're absolutely right. Coloradans love their dogs. Um, I... I thought you could bring a dog on busting if it's crated. I know that doesn't work so well for large dogs. But in Summit County, for example, they just changed the rules where you can bring your dogs on the public transit system. So maybe there's movement in that direction. Any other questions or comments? Uh, yes, Director. Um, as an elected official, the number two thing I get the most of is transportation congestion, um, not only in Broomfield, but also regionally and statewide. I even hear about the I-70 corridor. But yet voters keep turning down the funding mechanisms. Have we done, or has anybody done a study about what's going on with the voters' psyche when they turn down funding mechanisms, but yet it's pretty much one of their number one complaints to elected officials, well, at least it is in our town. Do we know why, are we looking to comprehend why they're turning this down? I just think there's a lot of education that needs to be done about how we fund transportation in this state. Most people don't understand it. I don't know if we need to be teaching more civics in high school, but you know, people say I shouldn't have to pay for that, the government should pay for that. So. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think in hindsight, uh, 110 might have passed if we had spent a year doing education and then then did 110. 
Um, so I think there's a great need to just explain to people and, and, and help people understand why the gas tax is not keeping up and will never keep up. I think two things. One, electric cars don't pay gas tax, mm -hmm. and we got to solve that. And two, um, in my opinion, completely unsubstantiated from any kind of official survey, uh, a lot of people seem to not trust our public transportation program management of budgets. And so I think somehow figuring out how to address that concern that for $300 million you're going to get X and it's not a billion by the time you get it done. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Director Vin. So if I recall about two years ago, we, we heard a presentation uh, by a group that was, their purpose was to entice the uh, Winter Olympics to come to Colorado. And the incentive for uh, the, the state of Colorado was that in theory, the federal government would bring some massive uh, piece of cash, perhaps in the vicinity of $1 billion, to improve the transportation system for those Winter Olympics. As of today, I've never heard the outcome of this. Does anyone have an input? Uh, yeah. Well, I They're going to Utah, I think. Mm -hmm. I think they saw that the citizens didn't really rally behind it. There was a lot of um, folks that maybe weren't excited about the Olympics coming, whereas Salt Lake City was begging for it. So that's my understanding as they went there. They, they remembered 1976. I, Go ahead, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, Margaret, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Did you come down from the hills tonight? Pardon me? Did you come down from the hills tonight? I've been down all day, but I okay. am headed back up. Oh, boy. Oh. Fingers crossed. Okay, I know Lynette's <laughs> going, too. Oh, you're staying down here? Good stuff. Well, exactly. thank you. I mean, really do appreciate it. And listen, I mean, we share the frustration, of course, on the transportation funding side, and I, I appreciate your comments associated with that. I think we're all very willing to have a conversation about a statewide solution, if possible. I, I mean, we really need to re reimagine exactly what it is you know, we're trying to do with regards to, you know, our funding initiative, because it ain't working what, for whatever reason. So there needs to be a conscious conversation. Um, and you're such a critical voice on that corridor, and I know it must be frustrating as all get out sometimes because of the magnitude of those projects. So um, I guess my question is to you is how, you know, other than coming forth with a couple billion dollars, is there anything that we can do to help with your mission? Well, again, TDM has got to be a huge focus. Even as we improve I-70, there's only so uh, many lane miles in the mountains and so many parking spaces in mountain communities and the resorts. And so we really do need to push the transit um, multimodal piece. And so as much as we can work together on that, I think that would be helpful. And that could be an, you know, yield fruit in, in an immediate way. No, thank you very much. And we will do our part in, uh, to help you, you know, um, publicize your, uh, you know, the gondola app and all that kind of stuff up through the hills, I'm sure. Right. Steve's, Steve nodding, so I guess this, yes. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Safe travels. Next up, we have a CDOT statewide plan midpoint report. Um, Mr. Papstorf and I'm assuming Ms. White. Doing together? Okay. Uh, Mr. Exactly. Chair, members of the commission uh, or the board, um, first apologies to my good friend Margaret Bowes for being asleep at a switch and not getting up here to in properly introduce her. So, uh, <laughs> apologies for that. I don't know where my head was, um, but uh, would like to introduce Rebecca White, the director of the Division of uh, Transportation Development um, at uh, CDOT. Um, as you all should be aware. Um, concurrent with the development of Dr. Cog's 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, um, CDOT is also in, embarking on um, an update to their statewide transportation plan of which our regional transportation plan is an integral part. So we've been coordinating a lot over the, this, the course of the summer in terms of our outreach and engagement efforts around the region and around the state to inform both of our efforts. And Rebecca's here to give sort of a midpoint update on the process around the statewide plan. It's attachment E in your packet. If 
you were trying to look for. All right. Good evening, everyone. And I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity to be back again this month. Um, Director Liu was here last month talking about our plan to spend the 267, the Senate Bill 267 dollars we received. Um, and tonight I'm here to talk more about the money we don't have, um, but as we plan for the future of funding we hope to receive, that's really the effort we're undertaking. So I, I know how precious agenda time is. I face that at CDOT as well, and to um, have us two months in a row is quite the treat, so thank you. Uh, I also want to give a couple thank yous because the effort you're going to see tonight um, has been informed by a lot of voices, and we have kind of an informal group that we've gathered together to help advise us as we talk through this in addition to our, our more formal groups. Um, and I, I want to point out Director Atchison, Director Flynn, um, Director Wheelock, I don't believe he's here tonight, but they've really been sitting with us through this process. I also really want to uh, thank Director Jones. She's been a member of our statewide Transportation Advisory Committee for a number of years. We like to say in CDOT there's no crying in transportation, but we come close and stack sometimes. That's that's a, can be uh, one of our more honest groups, so <laughs> I appreciate you uh, being there with us. That's where we, we have the hard conversations, um, and that's it's great to have Director Jones on that. So uh, I just want a few minutes tonight. I think I'll be able to give back some time, but uh, we are in the middle of, our, of building our statewide plan. We kick this process off every four years, and I think it's actually quite nice that we are in this now with RTD as as they look at their future and Dr. Cog, as you're building your 2050. So it's nice to have our planning partners be out there all talking to the public at the same time. And I think we've done a pretty good job at coordinating and I do appreciate the partnership. And you know, our, our effort every time at CDOT, uh, like with you all, is we wanna get better at planning every time we go around. And you know, one thing I think we all struggle with is how do you grab members of the general public and pull them aside for a few minutes, whether it's an at a county fair or on a telephone town hall, and really engage with them in a meaningful way about what they want out of their transportation system and what we should plan for. And that really relates to the conversation you all had. You know, we've gone to the ballot a few times and haven't succeeded. And are we missing a disconnect um, with the public? And the, are their planning processes an opportunity to get better at that? So one thing we're doing with this plan that we haven't done before is we're actually shortening the time period we, we look at. You know, we're required um, by the feds to look at a 2045, 2050 time period. We'll still do that to meet our obligations. But I think what we're gonna deliver in this process is actually a 10 year lookout. And our hope is, is that provides sort of a more tangible time period for folks to be able to see, okay, I can envision the future in 10 years and what I think my life might be like. And, and I think it has been more helpful to engage people on that. It also helps us narrow in on the, the dollar figure. I think you've all seen, I don't know, there's $20 billion shortfall list. I've seen 12 billion, I've seen 15 billion. But I think we're really trying to focus this plan around what are our needs over the next 10 years. And we had a good conversation with our Transportation Commission about this today. And I think you're going to see a, a more strategic list of projects coming out of this effort. The other thing we're trying to get a bit better about is, is have as much importance on the little projects as the big ones. You heard from Margaret Bowes, we could easily spend 500 million. We could easily spend a billion on I-70. You um, add that with the billion we probably need on I-25. These are huge needs and it's um, sort of a tendency we fall in to start to focus on those. But we have a big state with a lot of rural areas where that $100,000, $200,000 investment, yes, you can do a few things in transportation for that amount of money, make as big a difference. So we're trying to give equal weight as we go around the state. And then we're trying to bring transit along with us. We have, have had a habit at CDOT of having our transit conversation six months later after we talk about highways. And that really prohibits us from looking at things holistically. So we've brought our transit division with us in our kind of statewide tour this summer. And I think it's really helped. It's been interesting to see some of our, our elected officials and partners 
kind of think about the, all these modes in one conversation, and that's what we should be doing. So uh, we really upped our ground game um, this summer. We, um, these are a few pictures from around the state. I, um, we have a new executive director, Dr. Liu, who you all met last month. I can tell you I have never seen an executive driver, director travel as much as she has. Um, we hit all 64 counties. She probably was at 20 or 30 personally. She's really made a commitment to talk to folks. One of those pictures there, you see her at a rodeo. Um, so it's, it's been a real concerted effort all the way to the top of CDOT to really touch every corner of the state. And by and large, we succeeded. Um, we had about 36 community events, we 81 different meetings, um, and we touched a lot of folks. The telephone town halls is always our easiest method, but we did a lot of work on the hard ones too. So we stood in front of Walmarts and um, you know, gas stations and community centers, uh, lots of state fairs and county fairs, really did our utmost to try to engage people in those quick conversations. And I'll tell you, that's one of the challenges, um, to try to marry a five minutes of input with an hour you spend with a county commissioner who knows that system so well. And how do you bring those very two levels, very two different levels of input together into a consolidated plan? And that's still something I'm working on. Um, so this is just a map of, of our beautiful state. You don't realize how very big Colorado is till you drive to Hinsdale County. Didn't even know we had a Hinsdale County, honestly, um, but we had a meeting in Lake City, which is phenomenal. They have one state highway um, in their entire county, and they're actually in a pilot program to run off-road vehicles on that road because that's part of the network they need to have. So here's what we heard. No big surprise that you all are experts in this field as well, that road condition and safety are a top theme. Um, I appreciate the, the discussion we had last month about some safety concerns on I-25 and Director Mullica and Director Sandgren kind of weighing in there. That has led to a lot of subsequent conversations on uh, our I-25 needs, which are huge. If you look stem to stern, again, that's one of those billion dollar uh, corridors. But this, this we keep hearing about and is so important. And you look at what the core of CDOT wants to achieve and it's to provide a safe transportation system. We still are seeing over 600 fatalities every year in Colorado. Uh, not far behind is growth and congestion. Heard that more, of course, along the front range, but it's popping up all over as our state continues to grow. And then lack of travel options. And we've had a lot of good conversations about transit in, in rural areas because people, I think, are beginning to look at it in a different way, especially as our state ages. Transit is about getting your elderly parent to the doctor, um, not as much as you know trains and giant buses, but it's really micro transit. A lot of conversations with veterans too, and, and their challenges in getting to VA hospitals. So then when you look across to our 15 planning regions that we have in, at CDOT, you see these themes sort of populate with a lot of commonality. The only difference here is that freight came up um, as a specific issue, especially in our rural areas, which are these farm to market economies that so depend on having a smooth travel of freight. And then we broke down you know, our survey input, but again, you're seeing all these same themes, um, which we all recognize, but it's very helpful for us. And the connection I'll make to what you heard from Director Liu last month is that this input, even though we're not done with our plan, is already helping us dedicate those 267 revenues and figure out the best way to devote those. And it was directly because of this input that we're putting about 300 million into our rural road system, which is an investment we've never made before at CDOT. So that's about a quarter of all the revenues. So we are at kind of this midpoint. We have a report out, it's up uh, available on our website got a little bit of media attention when we released it. Um, part of the reason we did that is we didn't wanna go quiet for several months. You know, we were out there all summer talking to folks. It's gonna take us a while to build this plan and we didn't want there to be um, no other information out there. So we have this midpoint report and now we're doing the hard work um, with the, the planning regions across the state to start taking all this public input. I think we got about 20,000 data points 
consolidate that into projects and then prioritize projects. And I really, again, appreciate the partnership with Dr. Cog. As you build your 2050, we really rely on the MPOs to be the voice of the, the regional plans. We largely just take that input, um, hold cloth. So I'm excited to see what comes out with your long range plan and, and be able to marry that together with the statewide plan. That's all I had this evening. I appreciate the time again. If, I don't know if there's time for questions, but. There, there sure is. Is there any, uh, anyone who wants to ask a question or make a comment? Oh, sounds good. Actually, right. got off. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Ms. White. <clears throat> Moving right along into item number 15, an update on the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan scenario planning. Attachment F in your packet, Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. So I um, kind of wanted to formally kick off our 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan um, tonight, something we've been working on a few months, and many of you have been in other meetings where you've heard some of this, so I'm gonna do a light touch on the first part of the presentation. Um, as we've gotten into this planning process, what we really wanna talk about tonight um, is uh, the scenario analysis work that we're about to begin uh, and to get some of your initial input on that. So I think the video that um, Doug showed at the beginning of the meeting really kind of covered this slide, so I won't belabor this one except to say that, you know, when we talk about transportation, the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan really is, you know, our vision for the future of transportation in this region. I think you heard uh, Rebecca just kind of say that even from the CDOT perspective. Um, yes, it's a federal requirement, but it really is, you know, that guiding document for us um, and really one of the foundational pillars of what we do here at Dr. Cog on the transportation side. It helps implement uh, MetroVision, as you heard Director Jones talk about earlier, um, and really from the TIP perspective, the Transportation Improvement Program, those major projects in order to be able to compete for funding in the TIP first must be in the long range plan. Um, so this graphic, and, and I should say by way of explanation, our existing plan is our 2040 uh, long range plan and we're obviously uh, beginning our major update to 2050. So this slide kind of shows the simplified schedule of the process that we're undertaking um, as we prepare the 2050 plan. Uh, we need to adopt it by early 2021. So we've broken this out into four phases. Uh, we're nearing the end of phase one, which was sort of the visioning, education, information gathering phase, and we're starting phase two um, as we get into our scenario analysis work. Um, as we get into our planning process, you know, asking some of these big picture questions, these are some of the same questions that CDOT, RTD, and all of you at local governments have been asking yourselves um, about transportation in this region, you know, safety, technology, change over time. It's really these sort of bottom two. Uh, Director Jones already talked about sort of Metro Vision um, that you all unanimously adopted back in 2017 and that question of how can the long range plan really best help implement Metro Vision and get us to where we said uh, we wanted to be um, in the future and how do we get there. So I want to summarize um, in our phase one public engagement kind of what we've heard so far. In your packet tonight, there is a, um, there is a complete sort of write-up um, at the end of the packet that, that fully documents what we've heard uh, from the public in our, in our phase one work. So I'll give a light touch to this too, but I did want to show um, kind of a couple highlights. Um, this is a listing of several of the major events that we've done over uh, the last several months, particularly over the summer when we also went out uh, to county fairs and festivals. Um, we did at least one with CDOT together, uh, talking with RTD as they get into reimagine RTD uh, about doing a similar exercise with them. Um, but we did these series of events over the past several months. Um, particularly in our pop-up events, we tried to go to festivals and county fairs kind of across the region, you know, a little bit of geographic equity, but also a little bit of trying to reach um, audiences and populations that uh, we haven't typically reached in the past. Uh, we went to the Black Arts Festival in Denver, uh, the Westminster Latino Festival, Global Fest in Aurora, you know, Gilpin County Fair, you know, tried to get out to several different uh, locations. One of the things we did is we played a coin game exercise and I'll show you the results of that here, but you see on the bottom right, sort of the list of, you know, we gave people five coins, five buckets. We said, if you were in charge, how would you, you know, how would you spend those dollars on transportation? 
so from those public events, so this is a compilation of um, over 500 kind of results from, from our six public events. Um, this is what folks who participated in the coin game, this is a compilation of those results. So sort of transit number one, um, bike and pad, and so on down the line. Uh, we also did an online survey um, this summer um, across our entire region. We got about 600 responses. Um, I'll say up front, this is not statistically significant. This is not, you know, polling. That's not what we're trying to do. We're just simply trying to get the first snapshot of the pulse of the public about what's important to them. And we'll be doing things like this throughout the planning process. Again, you have these results in full in the back of your packet, uh, so I won't go through these thoroughly here, but just a couple highlights of questions we asked. Um, sort of that same question as the coin game exercise um, on a scale of one to five. Again, if you were in charge, you know, where would you spend your dollars? Um, so you can see some of the, some of the results here. Uh, we also asked the question, how important should you know, several factors be to policymakers uh, developing transportation policies and plans? Um, again, this was sort of on a five-point scale where they, they scored these things, and you see, you see these compilations in the far left. Um, but things like safety, travel choices, impacts on the environment, some of the same themes that we've been talking about uh, throughout this evening, I think these results are pretty consistent. Um, so that's sort of the transportation side of the shop, but you know, thinking about land use for a moment, we do have our adopted MetroVision plan, uh, which itself itself gives us some guidance about uh, land use and urban form. So this slide really just shows a few snippets of language in MetroVision um, that we've been thinking about and we've been looking to um, as we start thinking about scenarios. So let's talk about scenario analysis a little bit. <clears throat> Let me animate this through. Uh, this is sort of just a, a simple process slide of, you know, how we're going to step through this scenario process. Over on the far left here, again, we've been in phase one, sort of that information gathering stage, you know, hearing from the public, hearing from stakeholders, what's important to you, what do you care about. Uh, we've been preparing our tools, which is in the second box. Uh, we have a cloud-based uh, land use model, uh, Urban Sim. Um, as I think most of you know, we have our fancy uh, travel forecasting model, uh, Focus. We've been working uh, with all of you and your, your staff and communities on our 2050 base land use forecasts. So these are tools that we're getting, getting ready and getting together to do our analysis. Uh, the blue box, the third box, uh, defining and testing scenarios, that's what we're about to engage in. Uh, for those of you maybe who can't see the text underneath, I think this kind of summarizes in a nutshell sort of this process of exploring regional relationships between urban form, transportation, and mobility. Um, and I'll have a slide on that in a second, but it really is about that exploration between land use and transportation. And then finally, the last box, you know, as we get into next year, start putting the plan together. How can all of this work start informing uh, the development of the 2050 plan? So a few things about scenarios. Um, it really is a exploration of what if alternative futures. You know, scenario analysis is all about sort of dreaming and thinking about the future um, and sort of just testing some ideas, some really distinct, even a little bit sort of far out sort of ideas um, to sort of push our tools, push our understanding um, of those relationships. Um, as I said, it's a mix of urban form um, and transportation. You know, we all care about, we all talk a lot about that relationship uh, between land use and transportation. Uh, so it's a testing, it's testing those different approaches through the lens of MetroVision, as I've talked about. It's a relative comparison between scenarios and a baseline, and I want to be clear about that. You know, as we get into scenario planning, we're not picking a scenario, we're not saying a particular scenario is good or bad. Again, this is an exploratory uh, sort of sketch planning exercise where we're making some relative comparisons between scenarios. When we look at very distinct versions of the future, uh, we hope that that will highlight some interesting trends, relationships, ideas, et cetera. So some opportunities and limitations on this, um, and I won't go through this one by one, but we've got some good tools. We've got better tools than when we did this uh, six years ago. Um, so we've got, we've got the opportunity to test some things. Uh, we do have some limitations in our schedule. Um, as I've noted, we need to adopt this plan by early next year. Um, so we need to be careful in our time and resource allocation. And then the last one on the lower right, not everything can be modeled. That's a little bit of a limitation, uh, but it's also a, a little bit of an opportunity. Scenario analysis is as much about storytelling as it is about numbers. And I think we have an opportunity to bring in some qualitative things that help tell the story uh, about a particular scenario. 
So let me spend a moment on this slide. Um, and as I show you this and walk you through this, I want to be clear up front, these are not scenarios. Um, these are concepts that we've been hearing based on the input that we received so far, the input from the public, um, input from our Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, as some of you know, because I've come to your county transportation forums, you all have given some input. Um, I will be continuing those conversations. If I haven't made it to your county yet, I will soon. So this is sort of like what we're hearing. We're starting to put this together into some concepts that would form the basis of scenarios. We will bring this back to you next month a little bit more fully fleshed out. Um, but I'm going to walk you through this briefly, and then this is, I think, my second to last slide. And really what I'm asking for tonight is just, are we on the right track? Do these things sound like sort of the thematic concepts that you're interested in? Um, so that's really the input that I'm looking for. Are we, we heading in the right direction? Do we have the right ideas uh, up on the screen here? So let me talk through these just for a moment. Um, status quo, that's just the idea that as we, as we have scenarios and do the scenario analysis, you know, we're, compar we're comparing it to a baseline. Um, the top middle box, the transit concepts, uh, some ideas here that we've heard, you know, RTD uh, just completed or is completing uh, their regional BRT study. You know, they've done some good work there that we could, you know, put into a scenario and kind of look at sort of a regional BRT or a regional transit type scenario. Um, other transit things that we've heard, you know, increased frequency, expanded access to transit, you know, those sorts of ideas. So something, something around the idea of transit, right? Um, the upper right, uh, the highway express lane concept, the idea here is, you know, uh, several of our highways um, like I-25 North, US 36, C470, you know, we're starting to introduce uh, toll express lanes, managed lanes. What if we tested building out a complete managed lane system on our freeways and interstates? And in doing that, what if we, you know, directly connected those to each other? What, what would that do to mobility? So that's an idea um, that we're looking at. Over on the bottom left here, uh, sort of the non-motorized concept, biking and walking. Though we can't model a network directly, we can absolutely do things in our model to make walking and biking much more attractive. You know, what would that do um, to mobility and transportation behavior? And I should say, in talking through these, I'm presenting them as sort of distinct things, but a lot of these are sort of mix and match type things, right? So some of these things we could put together. Um, the congestion mitigation concept in the, in the bottom middle, um, the idea here is that, you know, while we probably can't completely solve rush hour or peak hour congestion, what if we looked at off-peak and sort of what would it take to really meaningfully address off-peak congestion? And there's a lot of ways to do that, more even than I've listed on the, on the slide here. But it's that concept of, you know, sort of looking at congestion, operations, management uh, of the system fit into that as well. And finally, in the bottom right, the jobs housing concept, I think is relatively self-explanatory, but the idea there, you know, is not everyone's gonna live close to where we work, even though we probably all wish we could, but what if we did bring housing and employment just a little bit closer together and a little bit more of a balance across the region? You know, what would that do um, to our travel behavior? And what does that say about the relationship uh, between transportation and land use? So having said that, let me just kind of summarize where we are and where we're going with this. Um, as I've said, over these past few months, we've been an input gathering stage uh, with our committees, with the public, uh, with the county transportation forums. We'll be continuing that through December. As I've said, we'll come back to you at your December meeting um, and have this a little bit more fleshed out. And then uh, the first quarter of 2020, uh, we hope to be conducting the actual scenario analysis work um, and are aiming to bring some initial results of that work um, to our Transportation Advisory Committee at their March meeting. So I think that's my last slide. So with that, let me just kind of come back to this one and kind of leave this up here, and I'd be happy to answer any questions and take any input that you have. Yes, uh, Director Jones. Thanks for this. I think it's really exciting, and I think this list generally looks great. Um, just a couple of comments, questions. On the, the regional BRT system, I guess, um, appreciate the work that RTD did on that, but um, there was some discussion about, um, I think they were originally tiered levels of BRT, and it ended up being uh, BRT that perhaps could get federal funding and BRT that couldn't. I guess a lot of the BRT that might not be eligible for federal funding is the stuff that's going to actually work in a lot of places around the, the region that aren't Denver. And so I guess I would want to make sure that that stuff is included as well as 
the Denver corridors, nothing against Denver, but a lot of us don't have that density. So that was one comment. And the other is, is there any thought of working off the Senate Bill 239 work and trying to figure out what's gonna happen when you throw autonomous vehicles and Uber and Lyft in the mix? Because depending on what happens with um, sort of land use and more importantly, fee structures around those, we could have all sorts of um, interesting outcomes that we don't really want with congestion. And I'm just curious whether or not your scenarios will include any of that thinking. Yeah, thank you, Director Jones. So let me briefly address both of those. On the BRT side, um, the concept here is if we did a BRT type scenario or a transit type scenario that included BRT, we would include the entire sort of network that RTD looked at. Again, this isn't a project choosing conversation. It's certainly not a funding conversation. Uh, we would wanna use that more expansive network to test the concept in a scenario. Um, Regarding your other question, uh, the issue of autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles, um, that's something that's come up in our input. I don't list it here only because I think that's gonna be part of the fleshing out that you see next month. We're talking as a staff about how do we incorporate some of those concepts? You know, Can you do it on the input side, on the formation side, or is it more kind of an output side of making some assumptions or some best guesses about um, the transportation lane use implications of autonomous vehicles and how you test that in scenarios? So we are paying attention to that. Thank you, uh, Director Molika. I have two questions for you, and please let me know if these are out of scope for the work that you're trying to do. Um, first off, um, I was curious, when it comes to transit concepts, you know, and with the survey, unofficial survey, results you have is, is really similar to what I'm hearing a lot from my community, is people want better access to transit. Um, should we look at or consider how um, fares, for example, are, um, causing, you know, disincentivizing transit use. Um, is that something that we should be considering? And then also, um, another thing that is, well, how do we, and I don't really know how we would do this, but like, how do we get our hands around um, understanding the obstacles when it comes to access to transit? So for example, um, Smart Commute Metro North just started a new flex ride service um, that provides um, new service from Wagon Road Park and Ride up to Amazon, um, Orchard Town Center, because there wasn't service. So there's a, a, essentially a lack of service, mm -hmm. which is obviously why people can't use train. Um, and so how do, we, how do we think about, you know, the lack of access and, and really trying to solve kind of those gaps so that we could aid in people actually using transit? Yeah, thank you, Director. Those are both very good points. So again, let me try and address both of those. Um, on the transit fare side and the idea of transit fares as a uh, as a potential obstacle to, to transit use, um, that's one of the things. So I should mention that in all of these, we've been doing some what we call sensitivity testing. As you can imagine in our tools, there's a lot of, you know, whatever euphemism or analogy you want to use, a lot of dials, a lot of uh, levers, a lot of knobs, you know, that we can turn and sort of play with. That's one of many. Um, and we've actually tested that in terms already just you know what if we made transit free for example um, what we'd want to do is if we carried that forward into a scenario actually you know scenario is really sort of a package of things so we'd want to put that together with some of these other concepts and test that as a full scenario um, so that is something that we're paying attention to um, on the access to transit side, um, and again, going to the transit box there, that's that's something we've heard from the public, um, and we've heard that from others as well. And so if we do a transit scenario, that's something we want to think about is not just, you know, what's the fare or what's the frequency, but how can we, in this scenario, make transit more attractive for people, you know, as a, as a viable mode, as a convenient mode of transportation. And again, thinking about relationships, if you do that, what does that say about travel behavior and the relationship between transportation and land use? So we're thinking about that as well. Richard Stoltzman. Thank you. The, the jobs housing concept is really interesting to see modeled. Um, and I, I sort of have a, a request on a different way of looking at it or some additional scenarios to run within that category. So, um, for example, in Louisville, we have, over the last 30 or 40 years, had a very different mix of jobs and housing. Uh, we used to only have housing, and now we have a lot more jobs. Uh, but we've seen the percentage of people that live and work in Louisville be very flat at 12%, regardless of the mix of jobs and housing. Um, so I think the assumption is that if you put jobs and housing together, that the people who live there will work there, 
Um, but the few cities I've looked at, and it has not at all been exhaustive, but the few cities that I've looked at, um, that hasn't been the case, that, that it's roughly, it's been roughly between 10 and 15% of people live and work in the same place. So I wonder if you run the scenario where you don't assume people will just coincidentally live and work in the same place and you fix the amount, the, you, you fix the percentage of people that'll live and work somewhere and run that scenario and see, is there an ideal location to put jobs and housing? Um, and then, of course, run the scenario as you've described it, if you co-locate them and then assume that people do increase. It would just be interesting to see those things in, that, in those two different ways. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Director Grimm. Thanks. Jobs and housing, I know it was a comment before um, uh, when I was um, and <laughs> some uh, but, uh, alternate. Um, and it's more, to me, it's more about um, how we work needs to change. So it's not just the happen chance of living and, and working in the same community. It's getting, and I'm looking right now at the top 10 employers of, of Denver, employ 25,000 or over each one of them. And those are large campuses. And we need to go to these folks and say, OK, can you take the 470 um, wheel and put four different campuses along that wheel and and people work in that region so instead of going to work and working with your accounting department you're working with in the north region and you might be working with different people but the technology of today we can do this we can work outside of your group um, we just got to start enticing these large corporations and like I know I pick on Lockheed Martin when I talk about this, um, but they've got a huge campus that thousands of people transverse. It's just an example. It's just an example. Um, but, but I think that's a solution for our future in transportation is not just happen chance the jobs and the housing are together, but how do we make regional working and yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Director Shaw. Thank you, and and I think that part of the scenario that that is being described by both of the last two directors is one that if you you may start out trying to live near where you work, but most people move every five years, and most people change jobs probably less or more frequently than that. So you end up working somewhere else than you plan to live. And, um, and, and so I think that we're on the right track if we're thinking that historical norms will say that only you know 10 to 15% of a municipality's um, population will work in their own community. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I have one. One I don't hear is an increase in telecommuting. And that it does impact our congestion because in my travels and in my profession, uh, some of the largest economic drivers in the mountain towns is somebody who makes a quarter million dollars and works from home. Uh, you know, I'm very interested in rural broadband and that's what enables people to work from home. So if we can get some people to do that, that takes cars off of our roads. Um, I know uh, Western Arvada, uh, the majority of the folks in our community do work from home. It's the wealthiest zip code in the front range. It has the most million dollar homes per capita and everyone works from home pretty much. I walked on a Tuesday knocking on doors and everyone is home at 10 in the morning. <laughs> so it does show an area where that area is very green. Uh, they're ver the folks that are moving that area are very sustainable and they're very interested. It's probably a lot of electric cars. It's the highest generation of uh, electricity where Excel's put a substation in just to take the power. These folks are very interested in and alternative ways of working and, and work and living. So I think in here, you have to put something around the increase of telecommuting um, because I think it is something of the future. And in fact, I think even the state and some government employees are now uh, being talked about, is, is your job a job that you can do from home? And you know, we have a congestion problem 
And uh, it does save taxpayer money when folks work from home because then you're not paying for lights and power and internet usually and other things. So, and it's a good work-life balance. Anyways, I'll get off that one, but I think that does impact our congestion. Anything else? Oh, yes, Director Dale. Um, just a couple of comments on the jobs housing thing. Um, how do they do it back east? And I, I have family that lives Kentucky and Ohio and all over back east, and they're shocked and appalled at the fact that we would drive an hour to work. They have trains. They don't do that. They work within five or ten minutes from where all over the you know Midwest. How does that work there? And have we looked at other cities and other regions like? Say Ohio, because the folks in Ohio, if you travel more than 15 minutes to go anywhere, they pack a lunch and, a, <laughs> and an overnight bag. And I'm not kidding, because you know, like, we're natives of Colorado. We do that because we can see that far. <laughs> and I think that you know, they've got all those trees and whatever, and the hills, and they can't see that far, so they don't go that far. And I'm not, I'm not being, trying to be funny. I'm, I'm serious, because I got some hill folk that won't go over the hill because they can't see that far. And, and how does that work in another region or another place, and how do they get around those kinds of things where people actually live where they work? And if they have huge, you know, uh, you know, all of those car building companies are there, and they all manage to be able to live and work within that region. And then the other thing would be, has anybody looked at, like, when you're talking about large campuses, you know, when, uh, like for hospitals, for example, like, well, um, why don't they invest in housing for nurses? Um, schools, school districts, why don't they invest in housing for um, their teachers and what have you? Because out on the Eastern Plains, there's uh, a brand new school sitting out there, and that's exactly what they did. They're investing in um, building, in order to get teachers to come out and teach their students, building housing that's affordable for them. So are those things that you might look at? trees across America is what we should probably focus on in a scenario. We can plant a bunch of trees. Uh, I, honestly, I, I do agree with you a little bit because uh, Seattle, I always think of Washington when you talk about trees. You can't see where you're going, so you just don't go anywhere. And you're just like, it's totally cow. I don't know where the store is. Um, anyways, any, any comments? So um, appreciate the input. Um, what I will say on that one in particular, that, that's a really hard one. I mean, you raise a lot of good sort of issues and questions there. I don't have an easy answer for it, and I'll just admit that. Um, the easy answer is that every region is different in terms of their urban form, how people travel within that region, the travel options that people have available. Um, you know, a simplified answer is that if you think of East Coast cities, um, Eastern Seaboard cities, they are more compact. They do have more transit options. You know, their commutes are, are a matter of time over distance. If you think of Western cities, a little bit us, you know, maybe more like Phoenix, Sunbelt cities, you know, they travel very long distances, but they do it quickly. It's just, it's just different. Um, but I think it raises the, the point that we've been talking about that it's a complicated relationship between things like, um, you know, housing location, housing choice, job salaries, job distance, urban form, travel options. You know, that's, that's not easy to unpack, and that's part of what we want to try and do here is test some of those concepts that you're talking about. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Rieger. We'll move right on to committee reports. Uh, report from the stack. Uh, Director Jones. So a couple things. Um, Steve Harrelson is the new CDOT chief engineer replacing Josh. Um, in case you hadn't heard that news, we learned about that. Um, we received an overview on the National Highway Freight Program and the proposed project list for that, which includes two projects in the Denver region, the I-25 southbound chain-up station improvements at Larkspur, and the dynamic speed warning system scoping on I-70 at Floyd Hill. But the biggest item by far was the discussion on how to spend the Senate Bill 1, 267, and 262 monies. As you'll recall at our last meeting, Director Luke came and personally 
um, reported to us on the proposal, the regional staff proposal for region one, which is most of Dr. Cog, and, um, and uh, region four, which is Boulder County. And uh, so it was all going fine uh, until they got to the region four monies in Boulder County. 90% of the proposal is for I-25 North and 10% was for state highway 119, which again, you all approved funding for in the tip and you heard me talk about tonight. And uh, a certain stack member from Weld County was not happy with that proposal and has single-handedly mounted to charge to try to change the funding proposal. Um, the tr Transportation Commission um, we'll vote on that tomorrow uh, the, for the $30 million in highway funding for Highway 119 and the rest of the, all of the highway funding. And then a, a month from now, we'll vote on the transit funds. Um, I am sure we will hear more um, on this fight tomorrow, but I do think we have the votes to um, have the region staff proposal funded. So it was rather bloody and very honest, as Rebecca pointed out. So, uh, but thanks to Ron and Doug and, and others for their fight to um, help protect that money and um, hopefully we'll prevail. Well, thank you and maybe there should be hazard pay for a few folks that go. So thank you for uh, sending our interests. Uh, moving forward into the report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Atchison. We don't meet until December. Okay, moving right on to the metro area county commissioners. Who will take that? Well, since Mr. Partridge is here and we were talking about consolidating places, we'll take the Schwab campus. <laughs> Roger's not here, Herb, so you can talk to Wynn if you want. <laughs> I'm not sure this is part of the conversation anymore. I don't know what's going on, but I'm gonna keep moving on if we don't have anyone to speak up on that one. Uh, the Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla. Good evening. Uh, we had a presentation from AJ Diamantopoulos from my staff. Um, he, pre he presented on the hospital transformation project at the state, its impact on AAAs and community-based organizations. This is what he presented at the, the workshop. For those of you who weren't at the workshop, um, basically there's a state initiative to encourage and incentivize hospitals so uh, to make referrals to community-based organizations. That sounds like, wait, that's a really cool idea, right? The problem is they pay the hospitals to make those referrals, but they don't pay like the AAA or the service providers to pay for the services that they're referring. So what AJ likes to say is that they're building the Autobahn and a brick wall. We're on Autobahn and we're five, way, uh, five miles away from a brick wall because we're gonna get these referrals from all the hospitals in our area and not be able to provide um, those services and they're gonna be very frustrated with us and so we're working hard to deal with that. We also got an update from Seniors Resource Center. Seniors Resource Center is our second largest contractor and if you were, might remember um, earlier in the year they had quite the big upset um, and all of their executive staff left and there was a bunch of key staff turnover. We were very concerned because we pay them in excess of $3 million to provide services for seniors in a large part of this region. Um, we, we did a lot of work with them. Uh, they gave an update. I need to tell you, your advisory committee on aging is tough. Kathy Noon, a former director here, former mayor of Littleton, is on the advisory yeah. committee and has some tough questions. Larry, um, director, um, Strzok has also, I call you Larry when you're on Aging Advisory Committee, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, he's also on the committee. I think they had some tough questions from for SRC, um, definitely uh, realizing uh, uh, that they're you know being held accountable, and I think that's really important. 
they are doing a good job overall, SRC. There's a few issues. One of their biggest issues is workforce. That it's just hard time finding people to do this job, right? And um, one thing that's important for all of our providers to understand, yeah, you know, <laughs> is that that's what we pay for, right? We pay for the service that their staff can provide. And so it is, it is challenging. Uh, we have wait lists um, in their services as well as uh, uh, lengthy travel book times because they're the, the primary transportation provider that we fund in the region. So uh, they're working on it. We're working on it with them. It is in our best interest that they be successful. So uh, it's a journey that we're taking together, it's, but it's that fine line. You also have to hold them accountable and make sure they're, they're doing what they are supposed to do with our taxpayer dollars, right? Okay. <laughs> Nothing's All right. free. All right, thank you, Jayla. Next up, we have the Regional Air Quality Council, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in our November meeting, we had a presentation on proposed oil and gas emission control regulations. Um, they presented their work program, proposed work program and budget um, for, as an information item, which will be acted upon in our December meeting. Uh, we took approval of uh, uh, amendments to their bylaws and their their articles of incorporation is primarily related to um, uh, just change in language related to the executive or order of the governor was incorporated. Um, we had a presentation on oil and gas well development and operations by a representative of the Colorado Oil and Gas Association. And last but not least, uh, it, was, uh, it was part one of a two-part series on trans transit operations within a non-attainment area. North Front Range MPO Executive Director uh, Suzette Millette, she gave a presentation on the work up there, and RTD is on, is on board to do a uh, December meeting, so thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, reports from the E-470 Authority Board, uh, Director Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, uh, our, our, our big item was toll rates. Uh, we decided, or we, we passed a resolution to freeze or keep, uh, keep toll rates the same for uh, ours, both on express toll and our license plate uh, toll. Uh, we also entered into a two-year pilot project to uh, reduce the axle, the per axle rate. We were working with uh, Colorado Mo Mo Motor Carriers Association. Uh, our executive team, Commissioner Tedesco and uh, Mayor Williams, worked with them, so we're going to have to reduce those tolls. We're going to try and be uh, more of a regional partner to reduce uh, reduce those those trucking and, heavy, and long haul um, vehicles and uh, take some of that, uh, that burden on ourselves. And uh, we also had a number of resolutions in addition to uh, losing our affiliate members, um, um, uh, David Beacom and uh, Bob Roth. Uh, we also uh, are seeing uh, Mayor Heidi Williams leave, um, uh, Council Member Steve Douglas, I'm sorry, yeah, and, and Mayor Ken Kreitzer. So uh, we have uh, five, five people leaving the uh, E-470 board. It's going to be pretty interesting. So that is all, Chair. Thank you. And reports on Fast Track, uh, Mr. Van Meter. Thank you. Two items to note. It's <coughs> It's a busy week for the RTD Board of Directors. Last night at their um, regularly scheduled November board meeting, they approved the promotional fair pilot program. It's received a lot of press. Um, that is uh, being applied for a six month period commencing with the opening day of the end line next year to implement a flat fare for the full end line. So the board adopted that, approved it last night in an 11 to four vote. <laughs> <laughs> and so staff will be proceeding with that to direction going forward. Um, so that was the item last night. Then tomorrow the board will be meeting in a special study session to delve into the head count and operator challenges and issues on both bus and, right, and light rail that RTD is experiencing, which um, is primarily to hear feedback from the public, from stakeholders, from our own employees, for the board to hear that feedback on the trade-offs, the tough trade-offs that um, we're facing and they're facing as a board of directors between potential temporary service reductions or 
unreliable service and the situation that we're currently facing. Um, so that discussion will be tomorrow night at a study session and then presuming we move forward um, some harder and faster um, discussions regarding candidate projects in the December and January time frame, not projects, candidate services for potential temporary service reductions. I'm getting practiced at saying that. Um, in the December and January time frame, some more concrete information on that will start to be developed and provided. Those are my two items. Wish you luck. Thanks. Um, one thing I do want to add to the committee's report, and I think we We've seen this fall off for a little while was CDOT actually, you know, your predecessor would actually give us some nuggets of information. I won't ask of that for you tonight since you had an opportunity, but I think moving forward it would be good for CDOT to throw out a few things as our partners. Uh, I think we kind of missed that from, from the old days. Uh, bef and then before we get into the anything, I want to take the mic just for a quick second. Next month, we're going to meet on December 18th as a board meeting. I would ask all of you to come in the ugly sweater that you have in your thing. I will wear one. And we will have hot cocoa and cookies and enjoy the holidays. And that's my treat. But you have to be wearing an ugly sweater. So let's relax, enjoy the holidays. And uh, I would like, it doesn't even have to be a holiday one. If you have just an ugly sweater, just wear it. Yeah, a, a Jayhawk on it. Oh, jeez. Here ugly, we go. It's ugly. <laughs> But I would ask the directors, let's enjoy the holidays and let's have some spirit and have Thanks, some fun. Uh, so uh, see you next uh, next time. Also, the informational items. Yeah, I just wanted their attention. Do you want to go through them? Yeah, m Mr. Chairman, I just want to mention one. I'd be remiss if I didn't. Um, on uh, item number 19, state legislative policies, the 2020 policies within these informational uh, items for your review and comments. If you have any comments, um, changes are fairly minor, but if you have any comments, we'd like to have get those back by December 6th, if possible, and uh, we'll be bringing it back for your action next month. Yeah, I was going to get to those, uh, your informational items. I just wanted your attention before you all walked out. Um, any other matters by the members? Seeing none, we're adjourned. Thank you.